G'day guys, Shrek here. Exciting development today. Today on the Noob Spiro podcast, Turbo has gone to the trouble of recording this live for Instagram. And uh, so you can get over to at Noob Spiro podcast on Instagram and check this video out. We recorded it right here in the studio. It's a great place. You, you've got no idea. But uh, now, look, if you're here for the first time today, welcome to the New Spiro Podcast. It's a great place if uh, you want to get better at spearfishing. There's plenty of obstacles to overcome, no doubt. It's a steep learning curve, but you're in the right place. We dial in on experts to just pull out their tips, tricks, and habits that have made them effective at spearfishing, and hopefully there's a whole lot of gold in there for you. Today's a little bit different. We're doing a deep dive into dry training for spearfishing, and... After that, we've got an awesome interview and catch up with Spear Junkies nut, Chris Dillon. Big game fishing galore in this one, so hang around. If you're not interested in the dry training, just fast forward through and listen into Chris Dillon because he's got a few just cracker stories and there's some great tips in there for hunting rooster fish and even tarp on. So listen in and hang in for that. I just want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Adreno. You can find them at spearfishing.com.au. They are one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores and stock every piece of spearfishing equipment you could ever imagine. So go and check them out in store. But if you are shopping online, save yourself some money. Use the Noob Spiro code at checkout to save $20 on all purchases over 200 So that is at spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro at checkout. Cracking episode today, Shrek, where we're talking to Chris Dillon from Spear Junkies, mm. and we're going to chat to him all about uh, his latest adventures, mm. shooting uh, dog tooth, sailfish, tarp on, and chasing rooster fish. He wasn't mm. successful at but that's uh, going to be a, a great part of the show. But we're also going to do uh, run through dry training for mm. spear fishing. You put together a wonderful article on how the guys at home that can't get to the water frequently can improve their breath hold and mm. keep their spear fishing sharp. Yeah, like for all the guys on IGTV, they probably don't know what our podcast is. So can you give them a oh, little okay. bit of a rundown? Yeah, so all right. So I'm Shrek. That's Shrek, and I'm Turbo. And basically, we're the Noob Spiro podcast. And every fortnight, so that's two weeks for you guys in the US, <laughs> uh, we interview a spearfishing legend from somewhere in the world. So somebody that is a fantastic spearfisherman could be in your part of the world, could be absolutely anywhere. We interview them for about an hour and a half, or mm. an hour to an hour and a half. Mm. And uh, we ask them about their history, where they started spearfishing, but uh, also we do a deep dive into their speciality. So mm. that could be shooting striped sea bass. That could be hunting the reefs of northern Australia. It could be absolutely anything. It could be underwater photography. Oh, lovely. We'll talk to that yeah. one, those guys. Um, spear, spear, uh, spear fishing equipment manufacturers. You know, like one time we did Manny Bubba from, uh, from Manny Sub, and we just talked about rubber. Um, spear gun components, like yeah, you geeked out. I, yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah, and and we're up to episode eighty eight. So if you like this, mm. um, head on over to noobspero.com, Go to the podcast yeah. section. They're all there. They're all free. If you like it, there's eighty eight episodes for you to get through. We've covered a plethora of spear fishing Good topics. Word, I you like, like it? Plethora, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, it's yeah. a real plethora. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, check it out. Uh, you can download it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts, you'll find the name Spiro. Yep, anyway, let's get into it. Um, so, yep, we're going to get into Chris Dillon in a little bit. But before we get there, let's get stuck into dry training for spearfishing. Just before we get into it, guys, if you do like this and there's some stuff there that uh, piqued your attention, head to noobspero.com and go to the blog section and it's all there for you in a blog format. It's easy to, easy to digest, easy to read. That's what we specialise in, keeping it simple. <laughs> yeah, just pumping dry training for spearfishing noobspero as well. <laughs> oh, you're table. laughing at, we keep it simple. Nah, yeah, we do. We're simple fellas, really. We're just basic, basic bananas units. We've got a plethora of <laughs> no, a plethora of simple, actionable information. Anyway, right. On. Right. So, dry training for spearfishing, um, as opposed to spearfishing itself or pool training. Now, why would guys do dry training for spearfishing? 
Simple. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, you can't always get to the ocean and go spearfishing mm. and your breath hold declines. Secondly, mm. you can't always get to a pool with a buddy and do wet training or mm. pool training with your, with friends or whatever. Mm. So dry training, it's a safe way to train when you can't get to the water. So yeah, nice. Right. Um, we do have some courses at, at, that we'll talk about at the end as well if you want a lot more guidance. And uh, it's very useful in particular, like you've done um, Pete Ryder's courses, which we'll talk a little bit about, Love the 5-Minute Freediver, which is a dedicated dry training program that's explicit goal is to get you to 5 minutes holding your breath on dry land. And uh, you had some good shit out of it. But anyway, let's let's talk into that shit. after. So dry training for Spiro is up on newspiro.com. Tips, techniques, and tools for getting into it. Mm. Right. Um, can, can you actually increase your breath hold by dry training? 100%. This is a go-to tool for a lot of good freedivers mm. and a lot of good Spiros. So mm. uh, it's, there's nothing new here, really. So we'll talk about our own experiences. But I, I reckon one of the most important things with any form of training is continuing to do it. The actual Absolutely. discipline of doing it. And if you're just going to do one or two sessions and think you're going to head out to the ocean and shoot a dog tooth in 48 metres, yeah. um, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, you never know. I mean, to be fair, you can shoot fish without training. There's no doubt about mm. that. But if you can improve that bottom time, mm. you know, that, that time hunting mm. and, and not time on the surface, you're going to improve as a spear fisherman. There's no doubt about that. Well, one guy said... Don't worry about holding your breath, just to work on your hunting techniques. I think that's kind of bogus because if you do have a good breath hold, you're going to be more relaxed on the bottom. Mm -hmm. The fish are going to therefore have, well, A, they're going to have longer to come to you long, mm. because you're going to be down there for a bit longer, but B, you're actually going to be in more of a rela relaxed state. You're probably going to be managing contractions better and, and you know, not blue in the face. Love it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's get into technique one to one. N nuts and bolts. Um, the turtle walk. Number one, the turtle walk. Mm -hmm. So why why is this named the turtle walk? So basically, like it's pretty awkward when you yeah. get caught holding your breath. Like people look at you and go, "What the hell are you doing?" Like, I like it because I got a big chest on me. Yeah, you got a big <laughs> chest on you, but you also got a big gut on you, and you're probably pinching your butt cheeks together like sympathetically, and so it looks like you want to take a shit and you're rushing to. So the it's, toilet. A it's the turtle head walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. There's, there's, right. a, there's a turtle emerging. So this is a great one. It's basically. Uh, Essentially, it's walking, holding your breath between a, between two points. Mm. Now, I'll, get, I'll give you an example that I used to use, and there'll probably be a lot of free dive trainers out there telling me, oh, geez, I'm not sure about that. But this is what I used to do. I used to, I used to live near the beach when it was really bad weather. I used to go down, and I'd draw a line in the sand, and I'd hold my breath, and I'd, I'd walk a set distance, mm. and then I would have a, uh, a recovery time and then do it again. Mm. Or um, I would... Draw a line in the sand, walk um, as far as I could. Yeah. Draw another line in the sand, get f get fully relaxed and uh, breathed up, a full recovery, and I'd walk back and try and walk past the original line until those two lines started to get further and further apart. Yeah, nice, nice. I like the idea of um, putting two lines apart that are not to your max breath hold. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're 20 paces apart, but you walk to one and then you pause for 10 or 15 seconds maybe a little bit longer, mm. and then you walk back to your original mark. So this kind of mimics the, the dive action, you know, like you're diving down from the surface, laying yeah. on the bottom, or coming back to the surface. And um, it's kind of a simulation, if you like. The other, the other way, common, common guys, commonly guys do it um, like with power poles on the road, when they're, just when they're walking anywhere, mm. between power poles. If you count power poles, if you get to three, you're doing really well, I reckon. Three power so, poles, that's all you got in you. It depends where you live. Like um, New Zealand, we, we can't. We can't afford a lot of wood for those things, bro. So that's spread right out, you know. Is that right? No, nah, no, nah, I don't know. But I, I think I think that's maybe sixty meters. Like when you're in a rural area, I don't know. It's not really important. Like it's it's really it's about improving your own breath hold. And so whatever your limitations are, you just work to it. There's no ego involved. Yeah, I'm a three power pole dude, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but they're kiwi power poles. <laughs> uh, and, um, but before we were chatting, and like <laughs> you can combine this technique with um, CO2 tables and O2 tables, but it's kind of more advanced. But we'll, we'll cover that a little bit tables, when, exactly, when we move yeah. on. So it becomes a dynamic table. Yeah, as yeah, for sure. Static. Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. All right. Number two, making ads useful. Shrek, you love this. You're the couch yeah. potato. 
Whatever. You what? watch way more TV. No than way. Them. You love the block. T- Turbo loves his Cowboys, uh, NRL Cowboys, not the NFL Cowboys. Uh, although he'd probably get into that if you yeah, looked, if you look at it. Cross I, over there. I yeah, love it's a good game. Game. I like it. It's a like bit slow in places, but they're really fast. Anyway, um, the the point is, there's always heaps of ads, and so you know, just use the ad breaks to hold your breath. It's just like one of those other little triggers you can put in, so you make this discipline of dry training, you know, like an everyday practice. Yeah. So maybe you hold your breath for one ad, maybe two ads, maybe three ads. Maybe the whole break, whatever it is, oh, but you can just kind of steadily improve because ads are normally that same generic length. What if you got Netflix and you just do a bit of Netflix and chill? <laughs> That's a bit awkward. Um, <laughs> do you hold your breath for our, our older audience, like Netflix and chill. What does it mean? Hey, what does it just mean? Just having a relax. I didn't day. even learn what it was till like <laughs> two years ago. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah. So that's the catch potato. You're just utilising your time better. Um, watching videos is number three. Our buddy Anvar Mufasilov, we interviewed him way back in the day. He's got a YouTube channel yep. uh, called Deep Spearfishing Encyclopedia. Yeah, it's awesome. It's yeah. excellent. Yeah. And um, if you check it out. Um, he's got a he's got a mini series in there called a uh, hold dive shoot, and basically like he's in the med, so you go down with him. He lays on the bottom in thirty meters, shoots a fish, and yeah, then comes good. up. He's very and so good. you can do that dive with him, you know. And that's kind of the whole premise of the show. It's just one dive from start to finish. Love it. And uh, I, I really like that. Number four, full breath. Um, I don't know about you, but this made a huge difference for me. Mm-hmm. Um, just learning how to like do the full three-stage breath. So starting on your stomach, then your lungs, and shoulders back, and just fill up that last sort of top section. Right. So it's a good resource for guys to learn that. Look, honestly, like your yeah, free diving courses are the best place to learn it because you get kind of supervised, and you're not going to don't don't worry about packing or any of these free diving techniques. You don't need that for spearing, honestly. Um, for ninety percent of it, anyway. Uh, 98.5% of it. Um, but a full breath will just get you to utilise your full lung capacity mm. and it's magic. Even for it's awesome. everyday life, yeah. like relieving stress. Um, you know, if you listen to trendy people, there's even more uh, benefits. We were talking about this the other yeah. day, how yeah. you've taken on a little bit of meditation and yoga when you're in Asia and you've no. you know, you've come back. I was talking on before oh, that, you just goose. saying. You, <laughs> yeah. you seem to, you came back and you've got Thai fisherman pants from your romp around Asia and you're telling me how to live my life and get your inner peace and I like it, it's nice, you're much more it's rounded, that's for sure. It's completely at odds with my theology, but I love you, I love your shit still there, that's great. Um, hey, namaste. Now, I was going to say, like, when you do learn to do the breath, the other thing that's important is the exhale process, so, yeah. like, just, like, a lot of guys work to a 4-8, which is, like, 4 seconds in, 8 seconds out. So just, and that's a good uh, rhythm to get in for even when you're out in the ocean. And how does that differ from just, uh, what do they call it, tidal breathing? Isn't it the same? Well, I thought tidal breathing was just normal breaths, just controlled normal breath. I think with this, like, you're putting a little bit of back pressure on when you're breathing out. Mm. So it shouldn't just be, it should be like a, you like, you pursed your lips like, mm. and it, yeah, it's it's better. Three days. <laughs> All right, yeah, two tables. Um how, how does this work, Turbo? So the way uh, the CA the goal of a CO two table is to train your body to work well under high carbon dioxide. Okay, that's basically how it works. Now, carbon dioxide gives you the urge to breathe, not the lack of oxygen. Mm. So that's a, it's a fundamental principle you got to get your head around. So the way a CO two table works. Basically, the breath hold, it's a series of breath holds and a series of breathing um, one after the other. Now, the breath hold component will stay the same, will last the same amount of time each time. So let's look at a two-minute breath hold. So you hold your breath for two minutes and you give yourself a two-minute breathe up. And then you hold your breath for two minutes and then you decrease that rest time by 15 seconds, let's mm. say. And well, it's that's a minute, what this table in here And says, it's a minute yeah. 45. So you mm. decrease that rest time by 15 seconds mm. each time. Mm. You get a slow carbon dioxide buildup and you learn to deal with that uncomfortable um, feeling of 
increase carbon dioxide in your blood, basically. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Last week we <laughs> last week we chatted with Wayne Judge, who's really good at this stuff, and um, your your explanation was pretty good. Uh, Wayne utilizes it in his pool training programs as well, and uh, it's a powerful mechanism for training your body <laughs> to work with CO two, and uh, mm-hmm. and control your body and your instincts when you get contractions, mm-hmm. because the worst thing you can do when you get a big contraction and you feel like you're out of breath is to scream for the surface full noise. Mm-hmm. You're better off just staying relaxed, calm under fire, and then just going. But um, doing CO2s is not an excuse to push yourself beyond that, your limits either. So it's, it's learning yeah. how your body works. <clears throat> I, I, I really like this uh, for addressing the discomfort, particularly when you're in the ocean, because like you said, uh, the ascent after a dive mm. is it's best to stay calm. Mm. You're going you're to burn less oxygen. You're going to have a, a calmer mind. And you're going to do better dives over the course of a day. The CO2 tables, I find for me, when they are really putting pressure on me and they have that urge to breathe, I find after I've done this training and I go spear fishing, I can handle that urge to breathe a lot better. Like yeah, my yeah. dives are calmer and I just I dive a lot better. Yeah, and it means you're actually <clears throat> spending more time on the surface recovering um, better rather mm. than like these panic breaths. And another thing you learn like with, with, with a freediving course or, or if you do like a pull training course like Wayne does as hook breathing, which is, an, is another factor altogether, which we're not going to cover today. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, when you go to the blog post at newspirit.com, the dry training post, mm-hmm. you'll see some more videos linked in there about just the practical aspects of this training. I've got a couple of videos in here by Adam Stern, and he does a, an interesting training technique. with a, It's a variant on a CO2 table. He's got a theory about how to do it um, differently. So check that out. Um, Look, number six, next technique is O2 training tables. So like CO2 tables, they are working on a specific mechanism in your body, a specific physiological mechanism. Uh, CO2 tables uh, help you to overcome and understand your body's urge to breathe and manage that. O2 tables help your body to run leaner on less oxygen. Yeah? Lena, yes, I, I believe it is. Your body becomes more efficient at using oxygen. Yeah, I think that's probably yeah, it. yeah. Well, that's another good explanation for it too. So, um, unlike the other table where you have um, steadily reducing um, breathing times, in this you have steadily increasing hold times mm-hmm. with the same breathe up times. Same rest period. Yeah, yeah the same rest period. So um, check that out. There's a, some table examples in the blog post um, just because you just kind of a standard look at w- what an O2 table looks like. Um, the, the next one is a bit of a, this one's a bit of a, a contentious issue. It's VO, VO2 max training. So basically this is your fitness component of spearfishing. And I would argue that Wayne kind of does this. Like for the first few weeks, he's really trying to get your body used to high levels of output. And then he's introducing the other tables. But I don't know if he would say it, put it the same way. So VO2 max is basically how efficient your muscles can be at using oxygen. So you can train this as well. But there's a huge argument on, on freediving forums about, you know, how and when it's appropriate and all the rest of it. Some people don't think that you need to work on baseline fitness to improve your freediving. What do you think? You got an opinion off the top of your head? Well, absolutely. Maybe if you don't need it for your, uh, for a single freedive that you do once Mm. as a freediver, that's probably fine. But I can tell you, the fitter you are, and if you're doing a full day's dive in current, Mm. (laughs) the fitter the better, 100%. Mm. I mean, you've got you've got current to contend with. I mean, it's some of these days are long, long days. I remember when you were doing your um, um, five minute freediver training course mm-hmm. and you were also kind of doing hill sprints and weights in the gym. Well, it's all part of it. But not the weights, but the sprints are. Ah, right. Yeah. So he's working in VO2 and that as well. Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So what did that look like? Just to, just like... Uh, so it was it was basic sprint training. <clears throat> I think they were 100-meter runs. Okay. Um, Shit. Yeah. That's That'd be hard quick, for an old yeah. bloke like that. Yeah, 13 seconds still, mate. Not oh, bad. Oh, 13 seconds. Uh, 13 five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, wonder, I wonder how fast I'll be. Oh, oh, you'd, be I'd race you. you'd be pretty good over 20 metres and then you sort of... Nah, I've oh, got mate. a big top end on me. You've got oh, nothing. I've raced you. Hands. You're slow. Have you? Yeah. Oh, you did I'm too. I'm down the footy park. No, no training though. 
before. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but you're no. older now, too. Yeah, I am. Start right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, iOS training applications. So, like, um, just just doing your breath hold in isolation is fine. Like, you can, you know, some of these routines, like the the uh, turtle walk and couch potato, these things you can just implement in your daily life. Mm. That way you're keeping some sort of breath hold practice going all the time. Mm. So you, you should have a good baseline of, of freediving fitness. Mm. Um, but there are some training apps that can help you out as well. I like um, the Low 2 breath hold training app. Okay. Uh, now this one's like three bucks or something. Uh, and I'll tell you, pay for it. Like, it's just good quality stuff. Like, the the cheap, the cheap, the free ones, uh, some of them are terrible. Mm, and um, I agree. Like, just, like, sometimes we're so tight about stupid stuff. Just spend the three bucks and get a good, good app. So that's the Low 2 app. Yeah. Um, Android training app, there's one called Apnoid. And this is free, and it's feature-rich. It's amazing how much this guy's put into this app. Mm. However, it's buggy, glitchy, and it crashes. Um, If you work out how to use it well, go for it. It's free. Do it. Um, There's also um, another app that comes highly recommended um, by Simon Tripp. It's the Stamina Apnea Trainer, Trainer, and it's available on iOS and Android. I believe that the price is somewhere between four and six bucks. Uh, depending on where you live in the world, go and get that one as well. That's another good good one. Um, links to all of this stuff are in this dry training for spearfishing on noobspear.com. So just come along and click through our links. Uh, we might even make a little affiliate income out of it too. I don't know. Do we? I don't know. Um, hopefully. Um, right, so that's apps. Next thing we've got dry training books. So... I mean, there's some phenomenal um, training books. Turbo's made his way through the manual of freediving. I got through bits and pieces of it. I found it very heavy and hard going. However, there's some really good info in there. And we talked to Tim McDonald uh, a couple of months back, mm. and he talked about what he got out of the book when he started as well. And yeah. there's def- some definite takeaways, and it's a big mammoth book. It was the number one book for Spiros. That's Andre Pelissari, yeah. <laughs> well, no, Andre's his, uh, his violent, drunk cousin, no. <laughs> Umberto's the fellow oh, yeah, you're thinking of. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was it was a hugely popular book, Dad. It was the number mm. one. Like every spear used to read it. That mm. wasn't until ninety nine tips to get better at spear fishing. Yeah, came on. Yeah. These blood stood out of the water. <laughs> um, there's another book here. It's called Dry Training for Freediving, which mm. is Umberto, Federico, Mana, Mono, Mana, and Roberto Chiosito. I don't know if I said it right. Kid Zotto. Yeah, that, whew, I like that. Well done. You got the Italian stuff just rolls oh, off. Oh, mate, don't worry oh. about the preface by Mossimilano Rossellino. Nice. You even got that. Well oh, done. Mate. Yeah, so that, that book's um, well reviewed. Uh, I haven't read it, uh, but if you want to get more deep into it, do it. Uh, Breathology by Stig Aval Severinsen. This book is very, very well reviewed by yoga fanatics and freedivers alike. It's definitely that kind of school of thought rather than a spearfishing school of thought. Mm. However, he really just um, communicates powerfully the value of learning to breathe properly because mm. none of us do it. We just walk around breathing like with 20% of our lungs. It's terrible. It's shocking. It is. Shocking stats. It is. You know what? We've, we've got to raise those When stats. you breathe properly, you, you just... You're just in the zone, bro. You're so zen. <laughs> you get the, you get well, the, the, the covers on these books, they always turn me away. Cause they're, they're a bit old. They're, they're guys, they're, they're ripped skinny dudes sitting on rocks doing yeah, yoga poses. With weird rib bones sticking out It doesn't translate to me at all. Yeah. I'm, I'm a skinny guy with a fat gut that likes to go spearfishing occasionally. Uh, it's all muscle, bro. It's all <laughs> it's muscle. It's all muscle. Don't muscle. <laughs> Um, last but not least, guys, thanks for sticking around. Um, we've got some dry training courses here. Now, these are definitely um, some products that we recommend that we get a kickback for. However, Turbo has done this training. I have looked extensively at the 10 meter freediver. Turbo is more focused on the 5 minute freediver. Mm. Two specific courses. The 10 meter freediver is a course that's basic bananas. Just all the techniques you need to get down to 10 metres or 30 feet. Yeah. There's, there's not a lot more in there than that. Uh, if you use the code Noob Spiro, you save 20% as well. And it's uh, it's not an expensive course. It's just an easy video training guide. Yeah, with some yeah. Practical I'll, I'll give you the run, the quick rundown of um, the five-minute free dive because I like it. Um, so basically, uh, slides and videos showing you how to breathe properly mm. and what happens when you hold your breath. Few uh, safety issues and dangers and, and things like that. I mean, this is a very short. Um, it's put together succinctly, unlike this episode. And 
and <laughs> it's straight to the point, and it's just, uh, yeah, the steps you need to take. The other good thing about it is you work out your baseline, um, works out, uh, it comes with a spreadsheet, and it works out your, t- your numbers that you need to do in your CO2 and O2 tables, and it transitions you from CO2 to O2 training at the right time, and also uh, whilst working on your VO2 max. It's all there in a program, so it's like a, a program that's customised for you based on where your starting point is. Yeah, nice. And then it runs you through right up until I think it's 28 days where you should hopefully be hitting five minutes. Mm. Now, he's, and, he, and he, a lot of guys have done it. It's been replicated by a lot of people, and most people hit five minutes. And if they don't, they get in the four somewhere, and they're absolutely stoked. Now, yeah, in, not, in not many people month, can do that. In one month, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. If that's not going to help you spearfishing, I don't know what is. I remember he said, like, it's the 28 days if you do the training every day. But mm. some people, their lifestyles don't allow it. He said, you can stretch the training out over longer if you want. He said, it's just like, you can do it in that period, but mm. if it takes a bit longer, it takes a bit longer. Yeah, I did it in 28 days. I found it really good. I used to do it, um, I used to do the breathing, the tables late at night before bed, and it just put me off to sleep nicely. Yeah. Oh, we were talking about that exactly. good shit about oh, breathing okay. before. Just, uh, Whenever you consciously do anything with your breathing, it's good for you, and it feels good, I, I, I'm telling you. Right, um, this this last one is how to tr- increase your breath hold for spearfishing by Luke Potts from Aquatic Rehab. I love this thing. Um, it's 20 bucks. The training goes for one hour. It's just dead set, probably the most... It, i tell you, okay, the reason I like it is because he works with what you've got to get you hunting fish successfully within your breath hold. Mm-hmm. He also gives you ways and pathways to just steadily increase that. And he also works through a couple of things that some of the other courses around don't cover, which, such as common equalising issues. Just And he comes at it from a spearfishing point of view, so it's super practical, just dials right in on it, he goes through all the major issues, and he's encountered half of them himself, and so it just works. So, yep. Yeah, all these courses are linked up in the dry training for spearfishing uh, article at noobspear.com. All these FAQs. Yeah, I had a couple of FAQs from people nice. like just people people were like, oh blah 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 blah. <laughs> like some of them are just simple. Can it increase my performance? Why should I train? Um, uh, yeah. And um, you know how to you know just if you've got some questions though, love to hear them. Pop them through to Turbo at NoSpiro.com. Thanks, mate. He'll add them onto the blog post and uh, help everyone else because if you've got a question, probably everyone else does too. And we haven't covered everything in this in this rambling podcast, but we've given it a good crack. Oh, all right. <laughs> Why are you yelling at me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Am I falling asleep? Yeah, you look like I was like, I've got to get him back on board. Uh, just got to give him some energy. I just was sitting here thinking, holy uh, crap, there's some dust in the new in the new studio. Yeah, that's that's what happens when you sweep half an hour before we do a yeah, podcast. Fair enough. Well, I want to make the place look nice. Didn't I? Yeah. Hey, let's get into this um, chat with Chris Dillon from Beautiful. Spear Junkies. Uh, mad dude. They're doing some great things. Check him out on Instagram. And uh, yeah, I like it. Cool. Guys, head over to vimeo.com. Check out the How to Spearfish video series by Luke Potts. There's nearly four hours of video training there, and they're divided into five different videos so far to help you take on the areas of difficulty that you might have. Now, there's a beginner's guide to spearfishing gear. There's a guide to how to increase your breath hold for spearfishing. There's techniques for spearfishing yellowtail kingfish, which also doubles as a guide to hunting pelagic fish. There's a a guide techniques for spearfishing snapper, which is a really good, um, helpful guide for approaching canny reef fish, which is a tough one. And finally, a guide to spearfishing around sharks. If you want to buy any of these videos, use the code NoobSpero and save a bit of cash. Check it out. Vimeo On Demand, how to spearfish. Guys, if you're having trouble getting off to sleep and you'd love a little story read to you, well, guess what? You're in luck. You can have Shrek and myself read you 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. It'll certainly put you to sleep. And guess what? It's free. Shrek, how do they get this free copy of 99 Tips, the audiobook? Two ways, buddy. Pump in audibletrial.com forward slash noobspero and head directly there and claim your free copy. Or you can go to today's show notes and just click through to through on the link, the Audible Trial link, and it'll take you through to the page. And uh, get hold of some nurturing and sweet 
tones from Turbo talking about spearfishing equipment and crayols while you drift off to sleep. Well, uh, look, welcome back to the Noob Spiro podcast. Chris, I have missed out on chatting with you a few times because uh, I believe I was traveling and then uh, just we haven't been able to get times to line up, but I've listened to all your chats with Turbo and um, I'm really looking forward to kind of hearing a little bit more about what you guys have been up to with, uh, with what you've been doing with Spear Junkies. So tell us a little bit about it since last time you caught up with Turbo. Yeah, well, thanks for having me back on the show. Um, it's been a busy couple of months Um you know, we started off the year uh, quite slowly, uh, and then we ramped up the trips. So uh, we've been on a couple of really good trips since I last chatted to Turbo, mm. and uh, shot some amazing fish. So looking forward to telling you a little bit about those, yeah, those fish. Yeah, awesome. All right. So, how long ago had you chatted with Turbo? It must have been two months ago now, three months ago. Yeah, two months ago. Yeah. All right. Before so, I went to Panama. Okay. So what? Oh, let's go to Panama. How, how long did you spend there? Who did you go with? What, what's what's what was it? What was it like there? Um. So we were introduced to a guy in Panama called Enrique Unitide. Um. He's uh, become a very good friend of ours last year. Uh, we travelled across there. Trevor um, Hutton from South Africa had dived with him in Panama. I said he's the guy to go with. Um, really does know all of the all the waters in Panama like the back of his hand. He, he pretty much dives uh, whenever he can. Uh, he has his own business and and, uh, and 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 most of that revolves around spearfishing. <laughs> so <laughs> the right man to know in Panama. Yeah. Um, last time we were there, we went and stayed at his finca or his farm on the Caribbean as well. This time we decided to focus on a different part of Panama. So we went up to a place called Haiku, which okay. is on the border of Colombia. So you pretty much arrive in Panama, hop on a small plane, fly about an hour and a bit, uh, land in this little tiny village, and uh, we were based there. Beautiful house, actually owned by a South African, which is very, very surprising, who had been working at Tropic, Tropic Star Lodge. Tropic Star Lodge is about 10 miles away from Haiku, a okay. very well-known marlin fishing spot for, 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 for fishermen there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So you're in Haiku. Um, is, how long did you end up spending there? We we're diving about eight days, I think, in Haiku. Yeah. Okay. So we did one day in Las Perlas Islands before we went across, and that wasn't that that that, that effective. The uh, fish just weren't on. But mm-hmm. when you get to Haiku, you're in. There's just nobody else fishing. When you're out on the water, you don't see another boat. So it's really pristine waters. Uh, we were fairly lucky with the visibility. It was pretty clean under the fresh water. Mm-hmm. You have this amazing. Thermoclock. Amazing, yeah, that it rains so much, you get like a meter of fresh water sitting on top of the salt. Oh. Uh, that's actually quite murky, and you dive down through that, then there was nice blue water below that. Mm. So, mm. Okay, and what else did you experience? It's like um, really kind of out, like out of your comfort zone over there. Was it similar conditions to what you're used to diving? What was kind of different about it? What was uh, unique about the experience? So we were there targeting two fish, uh, really. We were there to try and get a Kubera snapper over 25 mm. kilos and, uh, um, and uh, 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 a rooster fish over 20 kilos. Mm. Unfortunately, ourselves and, and, and a few of the other divers we spoke to at the time just hadn't been seeing roosters. They just weren't around. They seemed to be quite a elusive pelagic fish. They're either there or they're not. So we didn't see any of them. Yeah. We, did, we, did find, we did find Kuberas and we found that... The, the size of the Kuberas was directly proportional to the depth you were finding them in. Oh, uh, right. So finding ourselves going deeper and deeper. Yeah. Eventually, we're diving 30 meter dives. Um, and to shoot a 25 kilogram Kubera, which is very strong fish at below 30 meters, is, is you know, it's, it's, it's you're in dangerous territory. Mm, but sure. uh, you find some pinnacles there that were just so prolific with fish life. You'd dive down, you'd have to wait for the, sh- the schools of Barracuda to go past so you could go down through them to look for the Kuberas. Just fish like a biomass like you don't see anywhere else in the world. Yeah, right. Um, Pilot snappers, different types of fish. So we did shoot some good uh, um, Kuberas. I think the biggest was just under 20. Mm, okay. Uh, that was in here. Uh, and then we were lucky enough to find the amberjack on two or three of the days. So, yeah, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to shoot a 30-kilogram amberjack. It's a big uh, fish. And I shot that at yeah, 29 meters uh, where we were hunting Kuberas. This thing just rocked up put the spear right through the top of it, a good holding shot, but I didn't kill it, mm-hmm. and it pulled me hard. <laughs> when I got to the surface, I hang on the side of the boat. Uh. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, like, those, those, those pelagics, when you get the top-down shots, they always seem to be the worst for leaving the most amount of fight in a fish. Is that your experience? 
It depends if you get it in the head, you know. I think if you get it in the top of the head and out the cheek, that's the best place right. you could shoot it. Yeah. I didn't. I just got it mid-body. Yeah. It was, you know, I was at 29 meters. I saw this fish and I uh, took a good shot um, and, and I hurt it. So it was definitely hurt, but thank goodness because, boy, did it pull hard. Yeah. It, the, those amberjacks are one of the strongest fish I'd say for their size. Um, yeah. And that thing pulled pulled me out. I was very happy to make it back to the surface. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing, like, if they swam along the surface like a wahoo or something, It'd be quite funny to see if um, spearfishing fins would double as water skis because um, they've got a lot of power. You know, well, the two fish that do that are the marlin and, and tarpon. Eh? So that was the, the other fish I was really excited about shooting. Um, I shot a 32-kilogram tarpon, and I shot it in about 15 meters of water, mm. and it towed us maybe 500 meters, uh, uh, but, but boy, did it pull hard. Mm. I, I was um, saying to somebody, I actually had to chuck my pairs of gloves away that night that completely ripped right through the, both gloves. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. the access it was putting on the line was incredible, and it was stripping my reel. Um, and just to have seen one of those fish jumping, it was tail walking out the water, jumping, you know, really, really pulling. And you were hanging on to it. Yeah, I was hanging on to oh. their life. <laughs> so, I wasn't going in. How, how long did that battle take, and what, what sort of happened at the end? How, how was the – did they just quiet off it gently at the end, and you, you were able to uh, approach? No, it was still – it still had a bit of juice in it, so we pulled it and pulled it, eventually got, you know, within sort of kill shot range, and then my friend Enrico swam down and, and dispatched it with a kill shot, uh, put its lights out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I've got a huge amount of respect for tarpon. People have always said to me, these are, you know, fishermen dream about catching tarpon because they're so strong and they tail walk and, and they're just so difficult to land. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I saw one, I couldn't actually believe it. You don't get tarpon in the Pacific. Mm, okay. um, you, get, you only get them in the Caribbean. But these ones have swum through the, 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 the Panama Canal. Oh, wow. And wow. they're now living. So and we saw, I saw three or four actually. So there's quite a few of them down there. Um, you know, you're supposed to get roosters. We didn't see any roosters, and you're not supposed to get tarpon. And we got tarpon. So you really, never really know what the sea will throw at you. This is Mother Nature for sure. And uh, okay, so look, let, let's talk a little bit about Panama diving specific. So you're talking there was you had this unusual kind of one meter thermocline with the rainwater um, sitting on the top. And you said you were diving a lot of pinnacles. Is that pretty common sort of thing for Panama? It's deeper, challenging diving. Yeah, yeah. The fish, the fish tend to hang hang around on the pinnacles. There's a lot of structure there. Okay. The most amazing structure I've seen anywhere in the world in terms of underwater structure, just boulders, rocks, crevices, yeah. cracks. Yeah. So you've got to seek out the, the 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 deeper water pinnacles. That's where we find most of the bigger fish hanging out. Okay. Um, it, it really is spearfishing heaven, uh, Panama. And we were there in the worst time of the year. Unfortunately, the way we'd booked our trip, we were there in the wet season. Uh, we were there in the dry season. It rained so much there. We were there in the wet season. You really yeah. want to go in the dry. The dry season is January, February, December, those sort of months. Yeah. And then, then the cougars come in. They come into the shallow water. You'll, I mean, apparently, they don't shoot cougars there. They're like, they're not that good to eat. So why would you shoot them? Yeah. Um, so and they're prolific. There's, but but so we have to go back again. Now now mm. we <laughs> we've well, become very good friends with Enrico. So well, to be fair to you guys, you you've tried to pack a lot of action into a fairly short time. Like some of the fish that you guys have got on your list of twelve, that you know, like not many people have shot even half of them, or even let alone quarter of the, the the fish you've got on there. You've got kind of like a lifetime worth of fish, and you're trying to pack it into a short time. So I can see why you've missed a weather weather um, sort of window there. Um, all right. So with rooster fish in particular, what what's kind of the method for catching them when they are around? Uh, I, I heard they were kind of a shallow water. You find them in near breaking water and things like that. Is that true, or or can you sort of run yeah, us through? That, 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 you can find them in on off deep pinnacles or in the shallows, but most of the guys tend to be in sort of 10 to 15 meters with a flasher. They'll come in and have a look at the flasher. And when they come in, they often come in in big schools, 70, 80 fish. Mm. So Enrico doesn't shoot roosters as well. They're not good to eat, um, but he's shot one or two in his life just to, you know, just to, to, to see what a fight he can have on his hand. He said yeah. they're very powerful fish. 
Um, and uh, I think you just got to get there the right time of the year in the right place and you can get lucky. Yeah, yeah. They're an awesome looking fish and you can see why guys would shoot one or two in their lifetime because you can always use fish for burley and things like that. Nothing ever really goes to waste on a spearfishing boat. Even, like in Australia, barracuda are not a really popular species to eat, but quite often we'll shoot one or two. Um, and obviously because they're not um, hunted or targeted a lot, um, there's quite a few around, so it makes sense to use them as a burly species, and they are just as much fun to hunt as anything else. It's just unfortunate that they don't have great eating qualities. But um, all right, so that that was Panama. What was there anything else sort of memorable or noteworthy about that trip that you you really enjoyed? Um, yeah, it was just amazing. It's uh, there are places in Panama that are so wild. We 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 wanted to buy some coconut oil, mm. and we rocked up at this little bay in the middle of nowhere where family's been living for hundreds of years probably. Mm. And there's sort of eight or ten people in the family, and all they do is collect coconuts and make coconut oil. And occasionally a boat comes by and buys a bit, and that's how they live. They've got their pigs and their goats and their other little animals, chickens, and and they just live there in this bay and and have a little pirogue that can go out fishing on. Um, but yeah, just a really simple life, um, and, and just amazing to see the, 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 the beauty of, of the surroundings. Mm. It's like Jurassic Park, that yeah. place. you cup and there's just these waterfalls coming off the mountain straight into the sea. We've got some beautiful video footage of us all swimming and, and, and having a, a shower under these just amazing waterfalls. It, it looks, if you can imagine Jurassic Park falling into the ocean that's what it's like there have you got some good um some good footage of that on your spear junkies instagram page uh we have we've got a got a couple of pictures of fish up more um but i should actually put one of that um of that uh, there's a beautiful photo of the of the of the waterfalls coming down because mm-hmm. yeah I, I haven't seen anything and and chris coates who was with us hadn't been to panama before he 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 said it's the most wild place he's ever been in the world it's mm. just blown away. Mm. He's, he's been everywhere spearfishing. So. For sure, for sure. All right. Okay, so you guys wrapped up your Panama trip. trip. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful for a couple of your target species. You missed out on your 25-plus Cubera and your rooster fish. Um, you went home with your tail between your legs, or were you still quietly happy with some of the special fish you did take? No, with that 30-kilogram amberjack and the 32-kilogram tarpon, <laughs> I was happy as <laughs> <laughs> You just have to add That's another couple of ticks to your list. <laughs> it's about the journey and the kind of people you meet along the way. In nah, fact, sure. Enrique is coming with us now to Latham Island. We're about to go and dive with Eric Allard at yep. Latham Island off Zanzibar. So yep. he's actually one of our, our friends coming with us. So, you know, it's more about the people you meet along the way. It was really special to get that top and a and, uh, big amberjack. You know, those are two fish of a lifetime, so I'm very so, happy. Some guys talk to that about the ocean too. They say like, um, you know, if you're filming something, you go out and you plan to shoot some species and, you know, communicate some sort of message about how to hunt them or something. But you go out, you see none of that species and you see, you know, I have a lot of opportunity in other ways. And I guess you've just got to enjoy what's in front of you. There's nothing wrong with setting um, with setting goals, I guess. So, and that's the point of your trip. So, all right. So you got home. What was the next trip you planned, and how long did it take you to get back out? So the next month uh, we were up, which was uh, three, four weeks ago. We were up for uh, Madagascar. Uh, we flew into Nosy B Island directly from Johannesburg, which is a really easy trip for us because you know. It's, it's about a three-hour flight, three-and-a-half-hour flight. Yeah. Um, just be careful if you do do the trip with uh, Chris Coates because he seems to be the main operator running the, the um, spearfishing charters in Madagascar, that you keep your, your weight to 20 kilograms because we had a huge amount of trouble with our spear guns. They wanted us to leave our spear guns behind in Johannesburg. Mm. Uh, the, the reason is they're flying a lot of freight in on the small plane into Nosy B, so they only allow 20 kilograms per passenger. Uh, mm. And, you know, with your dive bag and your spear gun, you easy go over 20 kilos so just yeah. be careful try and keep your, your your if you can keep it to say 21 22 you, you don't get hassled but we had an hour and a half huge fight to get uh, all our guns on uh, and explain to them with you know shooting a tv series we actually needed spear guns for that a, a young guy come and asked me the other day um you know what do you how do you take spear guns with you and he had the right idea he was putting it in pvc pipe you can do the sports tube option, which is great if you've got the money to spend on it. But he said, you know, how do you declare it? And I said, mate, it's fishing equipment. You never, ever say anything about spears or spear guns. It's just fishing equipment. You're not lying. You're just not telling them everything they don't need to know. So is that kind of the way you go? Don't mention the word gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, in Cape Town lately, they've just started 
hassling us around spear guns. Yeah. They, they x-ray them and then they say, no, this is a spear gun. You've got to go and do all this paperwork and yeah. it can be an absolute nightmare. So, Do you guys uh, wear your weight belts on your bodies when you go through? Generally, we try to arrange to have weights on the other side so we don't have any weights on us. So yeah. Otherwise, it would be very difficult. But yeah, we have tried that. Um, we have been given some hard times at occasionally as well. But I think it's much better if you can get your operator or somebody on the other side to get you weights. Oh, but be sure. careful because sometimes the weights don't fit, which I've had that problem before. Strange weights that don't fit on your weight belt. That's mm. an absolute disaster. So, yeah, some of the guys and yourself, you know, you're traveling to more remote areas as well where maybe there's not established um, dive operators. And so, you know, you can see why some people would have to do it. We had a, another guy we chatted to, went to Sri Lanka, and it's not a huge popular sport there. So some places it's illegal too. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways around it. All right, so you, you finally touched down. You made it there after a bit of drama. You, thankfully, you had most of your gear, although you missed your top Alemani gun. Um, what happened from there? Yeah, so we get on board a, 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 a yacht. It's, I think it was a 54-foot yacht called the Catherine. The skipper was a guy called Paul George from Mad Fishing. Okay. Uh, Chris always uses him on his uh, trips to Madagascar. Very knowledgeable. He's been operating out of Madagascar for nearly 20 years. He's a spearer as well, so he understands spear fishing. And he doesn't use a tender boat. He drives that cat and he picks you up and drops you off like a speedboat. It's amazing. He's got a real talent for, for, for putting you on the fish and for picking you up and not allowing you to swim all the time. Yeah, wow. Because uh, when I first heard we were going to be diving off this big cat, I was quite skeptical, but it worked really well. Yeah, right. So then overnight, we left about midnight uh, and because you want to catch the wind. And we caught the, 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 the whatever the prevailing wind is and we arrived at Costa Bank the next morning. First thing in the morning, we were in our wetsuits and ready to dive. And there we were hunting, you know, the fish that you can get in, in, in Madagascar is a big dog tooth tuna. So we were looking for those. The spear junkies list is a 40 kilo dog tooth tuna, a 30 kilo sailfish. Um, I already have the marlin or twice. <laughs> I've been lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and then. Um, and then the GT as well, over 25 kilos. So those were sort of the key fish we were targeting. Yep. Got in the water, got uh, schooled by the first doggy I shot. I thought I'd had a really good shot into it, but uh, it wasn't good enough. <laughs> Sharks came and ate it and uh, oh. reefed me up. And yeah, I was really, <laughs> really oh, a bit no. stupid after shooting that fish. Oh. Uh, but we did learn quickly. I managed to land the next five doggies, um, stone three of them. Uh, and the biggest one I got was 53 kilos, which was uh, a really, really special fish, fish of a lifetime. So, yeah, I enjoyed that a lot. That was on our last day as well, so wow. last minute. <laughs> I think I saw your Instagram post for that. Like, you got some advice about shot placement. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Where you want to shoot them is just behind the eye at the top of the head and then out the cheek on the other side. If you put that shot into them, I, I got it right uh, uh, Three times and the fish just rolled over. It didn't even didn't even shake. Um, dog tooth tuna are the strongest fish in the world for their size. They uh, unbelievable. A thirty kilo dog tooth tuna will take two thirty liter um, raft floats down and they disappear. You can't believe it. They for their size and uh, they're just so powerful. I mean, uh, I've shot a hundred and fifteen kilo yellowfin tuna. And that didn't pull nearly as hard as a 30 kilo doggy. Yeah, wow. So it's a really strong fish. Um, the 53 kilo one I didn't stone, mm. so that was a good fight. We saw my floats disappear <laughs> into the depths and then return to the surface. And then we were pulling for all we were worth to get it away from the sharks, yep. get it up to the surface. Um, yeah, but it, it was properly hurt. I shot it well. So, so how, how how deep um, was the was the ocean floor on that fish, and what were you, what was your setup you were running? So it's, it's all diving the drop offs for the doggies. You kind of drop, so you're drifting into a reef that's about 30 meters generally, and it drops off to say 60 or 70 meters um, using a flasher or a bonita to to bring the fish up. Uh, using a breakaway rig, I was using uh, Chris Coates double roller 1.3 Rob Allen. So double rollers with twin 14s on there, 7.5 millimeter shaft. Uh, really did the job. Uh, you know, I didn't have any, I didn't feel underpowered. It's quite sad in a way that it kind of makes my Alemani redundant. I don't really need to travel with my Alemani. That gun will do. It'll do 80 percent of what the Alemani does, but it's you know it's a fifth of the weight. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, a lot more maneuverable. So it just it does the job. So breakaway with a a, a, um, a rifle. Float, um, float line, not 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 um, 
flexible, a, a solid line. Okay. And yeah, just two floats, eh? two 35 litre floats. So 30 metres of hard line on it. Yeah. Okay, 30 metres and then to your first float, and then how far to your second float? Then a three metre bungee to the next float. Okay, and it dragged two of them under. That was a bit hectic. Yeah. Yeah. Ne- they're amazing. Eh? I've never experienced it, but like, I've, I've watched it a few times and heard guys tell tales and just seeing that sort of thing happen would just be amazing in front of you. Because it's just so much power, especially when you understand, you know, how much energy it takes to move underwater and to see that out of, you know, you know, like you say, for its size, it's just an amazing amount of power. All right, what were some of the key takeaways you, you learned um, shooting a fish of a lifetime? Was there, was there any kind of, um, did you have any sort of mental connections that got made while you were doing it? Was there anything really unique or special about it? So generally you're shooting them at 25 meters and below there. So it's also pretty deep diving. Mm -hmm. And you have to let the fish get very comfortable with you. So you almost drift down into the fish. You make no sudden movements. You don't go towards it at all. You just hope that it swims in front of your spear gun. That's probably the best tactic because you've got to shoot it stone dead. Mm -hmm. So if you try and move, that, they can be a bit skittish and then they give you a bit of room and you can't, you can put your spear in the fish, but you'll never land it. So my takeaway was really get as relaxed as possible, drift in around the fish and then just wait for one to come around because they they can be a bit inquisitive. They can come around as they put themselves and then make sure you're above the fish as well because you want to be shooting down through the top of the head and out the cheek. Mm. And if you get that shot and you, you sort of see it, take it, pull the trigger, then you know, you just see that fish switch over and it's, it's, it's all over. And then you don't have the massive fight to get it away from the sharks. All right. And uh, I believe you had some other special moments on this trip as well. Or was it just five dog to a tuna? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, we had uh, we had some sailfish. So uh, both Jan Potkita was with me. He shot a 31 kilogram uh, sailfish. Uh, that was his tick for the sailfish, and uh, he really happy. Um, I shot uh, a couple of sailfish as well, but the one was over 30 kilos, so a tick for there. But the interesting that hap- the thing that happened was the the sailfish actually attacked me. I've got it on our Instagram handle. You can see it under sailfish attack. I know you just watched the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hairy so oh. we dropped in the back of the boat on the strip bait as the sailfish came in i gave it a reasonable shot mid-body um and then as we were pulling it in i asked a friend to to to, to keep pulling it in i'd put the kill shot into the fish and as i was going for the kill fish kill shot the fish turned and that sailfish came straight for me and i shot and just missed the fish because it's quite a narrow target when you just see the bull mm. coming at you yeah and luckily it's bull got caught up in the real line mm. uh, and that saved me from any injury but uh, i learned my lesson I, i'm i'm going to be a lot more cautious in the future when it comes to sailfish and landing them so seeing a billfish come at you it's got the thing right out in front of it you must have felt like a bait fish in front of that friggin' thing like you see the way they work a ball of bait like they're amazing you know they just turn on a hairpin and they move through the water like nothing else and uh, is that how you felt what was your what was your kind yeah, of I mean, reaction the, apparently one of the fastest fish in the sea and i can believe it when they first come in and they start dancing around you you know they're kind of they're all on and they it's it's they're so quick you get to take your chance at a shot you know as soon as you get it you pull the trigger um, but when that thing came at me, I, I thought, no, no, this doesn't look good. This is this is <laughs> this is not a good situation. And I think in the future, I'm going to get out of the water, pull the sailfish to the boat, and shoot it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, just to be cautious. In the middle of nowhere, there you get no medical assistance. You 24 hours from help. You know, you, you you really need to be careful. And I was warned by Mark Jackson. He had the same problem when he was there um, a few years ago in Madagascar. So yeah, he had good advice: get out of the water and shoot it. Okay, so. A few dog, a few dog tooth tuna, and then a few sailfish. Um, was there any other surprises in store for you this trip? Yeah, so I've been a little bit haunted this year by the giant trevelli or ignoblis kingfish. We we've been trying to get one of our, well, I've been trying to get one of over twenty five kilos, and in, Medi- in in Mozambique that should be a really easily attainable thing. But I shot I think three or four over twenty three kilos, and I just couldn't break twenty five. So. <laughs> Finally, we got to a bank called the Intermediar Bank, and uh, there's a place where the GTs hang out. Yep. So our first drift, we saw them. I didn't see any buses. Second drift, I was down at about 28 meters, and a, a nice one came in, and I shot it. I was pretty sure it was a tick. Pulled really hard, um, but I middled the fish and uh, got it up. It was 27 kilos. So, yeah, three ticks for me oh, in one wow. trip. So, yeah, amazing. It just really made, made Madagascar a really special place in my heart. Eh? So you went from... Um, kind of been a little disappointed in Panama, although you weren't really because you got two other special fish in exchange. 
and then you got sport when you went up to Mozambique. Yeah, to, to Madagascar. Oh, yeah. Sorry, no, to Madagascar. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we were really spoiled. So we, uh, yeah, we also had. I mean, Chris Coates guiding us in, in in Madagascar. He's a brilliant guide. He does that trip four times a year. So there's four different groups of clients going there. I can highly recommend it. They're also doing trips now to the Barren Islands, which we're going to do next year, um, which is further south. There's a group of islands. A lot of doggies there. A lot of Spanish mackerel, wahoo. A lot of other game fish, which we, I think would be great to go and target there as well. So with all these trips you've done, like kind of flying around, what, what else have you learned about like, um, you know, packing, gear maintenance, um, crucial stuff you've got to take with you? Have you, have you kind of, um, have you guys been found out or have you sort of discovered anything along the way in, in regards to that? Yeah, you know, I think it's always good to have spare equipment. So I have two identical sets of Rob Allen's uh, fins yeah. um, that, that, that I've got Cressy pockets on so they look identical so I just take three fins when I travel just in case one gets broken okay. uh, there's nothing worse I've had a broken fin in the arc just for the day here in Cape Town I've had a, a fin break and that's a disaster if you haven't got a spare fin to to you know carry on diving with for sure so I think it's always good to travel with a spare fin um, uh, maybe you know trying to t- <laughs> clothing wise you don't need much there you need a couple of pairs of shorts and three t-shirts you know mm-hmm. that's the thing often take too much clothing so we've learned to pare down our, our stuff to the bare minimum always a rain jacket just in case there's a bit of rain around mm-hmm. um and then spear guns is harder you want to take you know two but you always end up taking three just in case you're worried one will break so i think you know the problem with an alimony uh, being and i love my alimony it's a brilliant gun it's just, just so heavy and so bulky um, I'm probably leaving that behind more often than not now on trips just because of you know, overweight issues and, and the airlines being difficult. To. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. All right, um, so, you know, obviously you guys have got a couple more trips planned this year. Tell us a little bit about the, the next one or two coming up. Yeah, so the next trip up is Latham Island with Eric Allard. So we're really looking forward to going and exploring uh, his backyard. So you fly into Zanzibar Island and then you sail about 12 hours overnight to get to Latham. Uh, Latham's an island with nothing on it, just it's a sand patch in the middle of the sea. Uh, It's got drop-offs and one really good ledge that you work that whole ledge uh, for doggies. But it's also prolific for wahoo at the moment this time of year. Lots of wahoo, a lot of yellowfin tuna. So, yeah, but, uh, we're looking forward to, to this. There's four really good divers going on this trip as well. So we're all 30-meter-plus you know, divers. So apparently, you need to be able to dive deep at Latham. But the advantage of Latham for big doggies is that there are not that many sharks, and there's, it's hard for the sh- uh, fish to reef you up if you're on the drop-off. It's too deep. So you've got a good chance of landing one of those 100-kilo – well, you've got a chance of landing a 100-kilo <laughs> doggy. You've got a good chance. <laughs> yeah, there. You get a good shot. I think um, you, you've already, you're already happy with 57. So let's let's not hope you let, let, let's hope you don't upgrade. <laughs> I want to I want to have a chance of beating you. If you get one over 100, there's no chance. Um, all right, cool. So that's exciting. So off off, off the coast of Tanzania, and um, what about after that? And then after that, when we were off to Tonga, to, uh, we were with Rob Torelli on one of his charters there. It's uh, Chris and myself traveling over there. Mm-hmm. And we'll be yeah, looking in, in Tonga for all the big pelagics. Um, yeah, really hoping to get some good diving in there. Uh, I don't know much about Tonga, but I hear there's pretty good diving out there. Yeah. So, I don't know if you've heard, heard back from guys who've had some good trips there. I, I went there when I was a bit younger to the outer islands in Vavau, and it was, um, you know, um, coral shelves off the sides of these um, islands. And then just sheer drop-offs down to 90 meters, 100 meters. And uh, I was down on scuba diving, and I got approached by a three big dog tooth. Um, so that was very memorable at 18 years old. But that was a few years ago now. But Rob Torelli and his guy, uh, you know, they they pull out some special fish, and uh, I think you'll have a good time over there for sure. And uh, yeah. You know, we went with Rob last year when we went to New Zealand to get a bluefin tuna. Yep. Uh, we, were unlucky. we didn't get a, a Pacific, but I did get a 120 kilo southern bluefin tuna. So yeah, that was a pretty special fish. And uh, thanks to Rob for getting me that fish. Uh, <laughs> Enjoyed eating it. Oh, good. And then, uh, yeah, the final trip of the year is New Zealand. So straight from Tonga, we're going to head over to Auckland. Uh, and we're going to be looking to do the Three Kings Islands, do a charter up there. Try and get one of those really big yellowtail kingfish. Yeah. Um, you know, in South Africa, big yellowtail kingfish is 20 plus kilos. You know, not many guys have broken 20 here. Mm-hmm. I've got three of 19 kilos. Yeah. So I'm really hoping 
get something really big there. And uh, either we'll do White Island. I believe that's a backup option if Three Kings weather's not good. Okay. But, uh, yeah, that'll be the, the end of Spear Junkies for 2018. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, the far north of New Zealand's the place to go for these big yellowtail kingfish. There are a few locations, and I believe you'll be in good hands over there. There's some uh, great Kiwi guides. Um, you know, former guest in that Davey, but um, unfortunately he's out of action for you this time. But, um, you know, we had a bit of a chat before the show. There's uh, the boys at Spiro Camp, um, Julian Hansford. He, he's a he's a good guy as well, we've heard a bit about. So we'll have to get him on the show at some stage. And some of these other dudes you've been encountering too, Chris. Yeah, you'll have to chat to Enrico sometime. He's, mm. uh, he's a very colourful character, brilliant mm. guy. So I'll mm. tell him, uh, let him listen to some Noob Spiro podcast while we're mm. on the boat in, in uh, Latham. Oh, good. And guys can come and find you guys on Instagram at Spear Junkies. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Please and follow. So. Keep keep track of all the action and uh, reach out and um and and yeah, we'll, we'll have to stay in touch and hear about how your next big trip goes. I'm I'm uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Okay, we'll let you know when we get back from Latham. Yeah, cool. All right, Chris. Thanks for catching nice up, mate. <laughs> Take it easy, Shrek. Bye. Yosemite National Park, California. Red Sox. Hang loose, bro. <laughs> SpearingMagazine.com Did you say SpearingMagazine.com? I did, I did. What do you know about Spearing Magazine? I know that you can get eight issues for 30 US dollars plus shipping. But oh you've got to email it. Oh my God. Oh Lordy Lou. Oh. But what you got to do is you got to email Jeremy at SpearingMagazine.com That's oh. right. J-E-R-O-M-Y at SpearingMagazine.com Oh my God, $30 US for eight issues, Turbo? That is phenomenal value. Email Jeremy at SpearingMagazine.com. Jeremy at SpearingMagazine.com. J E R O M Y at SpearingMagazine.com. Guys. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. It was a little bit unusual, a two-parter. We've got the dry training bolted on the front and then Spear Junkies man Chris Dillon at the back. There's definitely a whole heap of gold in there. Uh, it might have seemed like uh, we were a bit all over the place today, but I hope you got a ton of stuff out of it, either one section or the other. And if you did, we'd love to hear about it on Instagram. Head over to new, at New Spiro Podcast on Insta and watch the live video in the studio. Turbo and I getting jiggy. And uh, it's, pretty, yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Look, um, in the next fortnight, fortnight's two weeks, by the way, um, we are headed to Carolina to catch up with Sam Blount from Frontline Freediving. We dig right into emergency first aid. And, uh, man, this is a, one you don't want to miss. Seriously, there is an absolute ton of just bombs in this interview. Funny jokes, great tips, actionable information. You kind of expect it from us, but I'm telling you that you're in for a treat. So come back in a fortnight as well. Sam Blount from Frontline Freediving. Thanks for listening today, guys. Leave us a review if you can as well. Peace. Sometimes it's time to spend some money on yourself. And there's nothing like a new spear gun. That's right. Head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a big range of spear guns. Get tempted and read the customer reviews and really sort of have a look at what they've got to offer. Turbo and I love the Manny Sub roller guns. You can buy them at spearfishing.com.au. Go in and check out the spear guns. If you do decide to buy something, pump in the code new spear at checkout and save $20 on every purchase over $200. If you do have problems, they have a hassle free returns policy, cheap shipping rate worldwide, and a price beat guarantee for Australia. Online, they also have live help. You can talk to people online and ask any questions you might have about products. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a huge range of spear guns. Hey guys, thanks for listening to today's show. I hope you really enjoyed it. As usual, we had a phenomenal guest. And uh, if you've ever got any guest suggestions, you can always email us, Turbo at Noob Spiro or Shrek at Noob Spiro. Give us any feedback you might have. But if you want to, you might you might be interested in connecting more and, and jumping in and joining our community. Turbo, how can people do that? Well, one of the things they can do is join our newsletter, The Floater. That's one way of doing it. So go to our website um, or go to our Facebook page and it says join there. So uh, you can do that. The other thing you can do is join the Noob Spiro community. Now that's uh, full of like-minded Spiros all trying to get better at spearfishing and uh, our guests get on there from time to time and give a few tips away and that kind of thing. So uh, all good stuff. Shrek, what else can they do? 
Guys, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Get a hold of uh, Turbo. He's always dropping a pose somewhere. And uh, check, yeah, just, just, just join us. Thanks for uh, listening to today's show.